All right, in this video, I'm going to be introducing some concepts to go along with two-dimensional motion, um, which I did subtitle one dimension away from the real world. And yes, the real world has three spatial dimensions, but um, two dimensions actually do can describe quite a few of the problems that uh, come up in the real world, because in the real world, a lot of times you're either, you know, a lot of times you'll be moving both vertically and horizontally, but usually you can think, you know, most motion only takes place horizontally one way, not two ways at the same time. Um, of course, there are motions that do need three, but, uh, you know, once you understand two dimensions, um, getting a third in there uh, is just, you know, one more step, okay? So the first thing that we want to make sure we understand is how perpendicular directions are related. And the thing is, is when two dimensions are perpendicular, which means at right angles to each other, then their motions are independent of each other. And so the boat across the river example is one that's often used uh, to illustrate this point. So let's say if I have a boat um, that's traveling across the river and the boat's going five meters per second and the river is 300 meters across. And so if I looked at, well, how long does it take for the boat to cross this river? It's gonna take, so I could use the equation D equals VT, okay? And so the distance is 300 meters and the velocity was five meters per second. And I'm looking for time. And so time will then equal 60 seconds, okay? So it's gonna take 60 seconds for the boat to cross this river if the water is not moving. What about if the water is moving perpendicular to the, whoops, didn't mean to click there. Um, what if the water is moving at five meters per second relative to the motion of the boat? Well, it actually turns out that it's gonna take the same 60 seconds to cross the river as it did before. It's just now the boat will have ended up 300 meters downstream rather than being directly across. And so the fact that the river is moving at five meters per second the boat does end up moving faster because it moves from here to here instead of just across the stream. So overall, the boat did go faster because it went further, but it still just takes 60 seconds to cross. But in that 60 seconds, it also goes down. If the river were to go even faster, well now, let's say it went 10 meters per second, now because it's moving twice as fast downstream as it is across the stream, the boat will end up 600 meters downstream, but it still just took 60 seconds. So in 60 seconds, you can see 60 seconds times 10 meters per second is 600 meters, okay? And if the river was going even faster, then the boat would go even further downstream, okay? So again, how long it takes to cross the river is only determined by the boat's speed across the river, and how far it goes down the river is only determined by how fast the river is going. So if instead of going at five meters per second, if the boat went across the river at one meter per second, it would take longer to cross the river. And because of that, it actually would end up going um, further downstream also. This is just like when you were having the robot go across the tag board, okay? Depending um, when the, you pulled the tag board perpendicular to the way the robot was moving, it should have taken the same amount of time to go from meter stick to meter stick. Uh, so another type, so a common type of two-dimensional motion to study uh, in beginning physics is projectile motion. And so projectiles is whenever you throw something through the air. And we're familiar with it following this arc. So some different terms that go along with this. So what's often important, what angle we throw it at. So that angle is represented here by an A. What speed we throw it at. And that speed, even though it's at some angle that's neither horizontal or vertical, we can think of it as being made up of two different velocity vectors, one in the horizontal direction and one in the vertical direction. And these two vectors combine to make the overall velocity vector. When you have something being thrown in the air, if you look at the force diagram, the only force on here is this black arrow, which is labeled with a little g. Um, I think that's actually supposed to represent its acceleration vector, but 
that would be the only direction of force that was on there, and that's the force of weight. So there's only one force, there's the force of weight on an object as it's being thrown. So if we look at our equations of motion, in the horizontal direction for projectiles, there's no um, acceleration or because there's no forces in the horizontal direction. Okay, So since there are no forces in the horizontal direction, there's no acceleration. And so we get X, is, which X, capital X, just stands for our distance, how far in the horizontal direction. So this is our X. So that equals our velocity in the X direction times time. So that's very similar to this equation here that we've already used. So instead of D, we have X, okay? And then we're talking about our initial velocity in the X direction times time. So these are all have, you know, one-to-one -one correspondence there. And then um, in the vertical direction, however, there is a force that's unbalanced, that force of weight. So we do have acceleration. And so the equation that governs where we're at in the vertical direction is what's given here. And this, again, um, it should be familiar to us. Okay, so that would be, let me just get a new drawing here. Okay, so that y equation is just like the equation we've used before. Uh, that's not a good tool to be using. Let me get a pencil. Okay, so that's very similar to D equals VIT plus one-half AT squared. But now our VI, we're calling V not Y because it's our initial speed in the Y direction. And A, because we're accelerating due to weight only, is equal to the acceleration of gravity or 9.8 meters per second squared. And then D, we're calling Y to let people know that we're talking about our displacement in the vertical direction. Oh, too far. Don't want a calculator. Come on. There we go. All right. So um, one new relationship that you've probably never, you haven't really worked with trig relationships before is looking at how is the overall velocity, this V0 over here, how is this V0 related to V0Y and V0X? How are these two things related? And those use trigonometry relationships which have to do with triangles. And we're not going to go into why this is. That's something that you'll be learning in math class. But the x component, the x part of the velocity, is equal to the overall velocity times what's called the cosine, which for you, you can just think of as a button on your calculator right now, time, or the cosine of, sorry, the angle. And the y component is equal to the overall velocity times the sine. Um, of the angle. And again, in math class at some point you'll be learning more about these cosines and sines. For now it's a button we have to hit on our calculator and we'll practice doing that together. Okay, so we're going to be with projectiles, we're going to be learning how to do two different types of problems. And just in the interest of time on this video, this is definitely, this will be a problem that we'll be working in class. Okay, so we're going to learn how to do a Thelma and Louise type problem. And if you don't understand the reference, because uh, you've never seen the movie, I actually have never seen the movie either, but because of how old I am, I understand the reference. Um, you can certainly look into what that means. So what's special about a Thelma and Louise problem is that your horizontal velocity, which is V not X, is the same as your overall velocity, because you're driving straight horizontally off a cliff. And your vertical component of the velocity is zero, because it's not moving up or down. And your path will look something like this. Okay. Uh, the other type of problem that we'll be learning how to do, um, I like to call the Dukes of Hazard problem. And in the Dukes of Hazard problem, we do have to find the two different components of our velocity because we're going, when we go up a ramp, some of our velocity is vertical and some of our velocity is horizontal. So we have to be able to find both of those. The one thing that people oftentimes don't realize is that our y is zero. So our Vertical displacement is what y means is zero because in a Dukes of Hazard type problem you go up and then you come back down to the same level. So what level, what amount your level is changed by is zero. It hasn't actually changed at all. 
So your X is not zero, but your Y is. So even though you went up, you came back down the exact same amount. So that's the a special case of projectile motion that I like to call the Dukes of Hazard problem. Okay. Um, then we have uh, circular motion. Okay, is another type of two-dimensional motion that we want to be familiar with. Okay. So again, just to remind you that you don't have to be speeding up or slowing down to be accelerating. You could be turning as well. And so if I've got this smiley face going around and around in a circle, there's always an inward force on the smiley face and uh, it's accelerating inwards. Okay. Hopefully in lab, what you saw is that if you were to double how fast something was going around in a circle, the force on that object has to more than double, okay? Um, so it's actually, your acceleration is related to your velocity squared. And then it's also related to how big of a circle you have. So the bigger the circle, the smaller you're accelerating because the less you have to turn. So you're probably familiar with this already. It's much harder to make a tight circle than it is to, uh, you know, make a less tight circle. So the bigger the circle around, the easier it is to turn. Okay, so the types of problems we're going to be doing this has to do with can we find the centripetal force? And again, this is going to go into like looking at what are the sum of our forces are going to be really important. So um, a common thing to look at with this is carnival rides. So think if you're on a roller coaster and you're at the top um, and it usually doesn't feel like you're pushing your seat at all, but you might not be falling either. So what ends up happening is that your net force is represented by this yellow. That's the force that's actually turning you. And that's what we're calling the centripetal force. The centripetal force is always the force that turns you. And that's a combination of two things. Okay, It's a combination of the normal force, how hard the seat's pushing on you, and how much you weigh. Okay, Now if you go at the right speed, then your weight will actually be the exact same size as the norm, as the centripetal force, and you won't have any normal force at all. And in that case, you'll actually feel weightless as, as you go around the corner, and that's pretty common in these rides. Um, if you go faster, then your normal force has to get bigger um, so that your normal force and weight both add together. Now that's very different when you're at the bottom of the circle, okay, is that your the normal force, how hard the seat has to push on you, has to be much bigger than your weight because not only does it have to balance out weight but it also has to supply that force to turn you to keep you from going in a straight line okay so the normal force will get very large at the bottom of any hill um, any bottom of any turn on a roller coaster and also on a swing because that normal force has to both counter gravity and also um, put in the force needed to turn you as well for that centripetal force um, another carnival ride where centripetal force uh, becomes important, and this is a fun one to look at, is looking at the Gravitron, uh, the one where you get inside and it spins really fast, and then the floor drops away from you. Uh, in this case, uh, the, the force is on you, and uh, here I didn't label it very well, but the net force on you uh, inward is going to be the normal force actually of the wall on you so the normal force of the wall is providing that inward centripetal force and the reason why you don't fall down is it's spinning you fast enough where the force of friction of the wall on you and your weight are balanced out and so to get that friction high enough remember friction is related to the, the size of the normal force so if you're not spinning fast enough, the normal force isn't great enough, and so friction won't be great enough, and then you'll slide down with the wall. Um, interestingly, it doesn't matter if you're a small child or a large man or a medium-massed woman. The amount of centripetal force it takes, the amount of centripetal acceleration to keep you from sliding down um, is actually like independent of your mass. It might matter how slippery the clothing is you have on, um, but it won't your mass won't matter at all. All right, I've used up my 15 minutes here, so uh, we'll call it good and we'll do some example problems tomorrow in class.